The New Jersey Pine Barrens, also known as the Pinelands or simply the Pines, exists as the largest remaining example of the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens ecosystem, which stretches more than seven counties in the state of New Jersey. Beginning in the 1600s, European settlers began inhabiting the region, establishing trade and eventually industry into this sprawling rural area. Many small towns would be established here, many towns that would one day dot the landscape as abandoned reminders of New Jersey's colonial and industrial past. One such ruin is the town of Harrisville. Once a small production community best known for producing paper under the ownership of the Harris family, after a fire in 1914, the town would be abandoned, existing today only as rubble. This is the story of the ghost town of Harrisville, New Jersey. First, let's go over an abbreviated timeline of the settlement and the development of the Pine Barrens region. During the 17th century, Swedish and Dutch colonists in North America explored and settled in the area that would become New Jersey, developing whaling and fishing settlements primarily along the Delaware River. In 1606, the English would claim the area under the London Company, a joint stock company established in the same year by royal charter by King James I with the purpose of establishing colonial settlements in North America, with the Dutch later abandoning their claims to the English in 1664. In 1688, shipbuilding operations would commence in the area, utilizing the cedar, oak, and pitch trees as well as the local tar and turpentine. The first sawmills and grist mills would later open around 1700, leading to the first established European settlements in the Pinelands. The first Indian reservation in the Americas would be founded in Brotherton in 1758, situated in what is now Indian Mills in Shemong Township. During the American Revolutionary War in 1778, the British burned and pillaged the village of Chestnut Neck in a failed attempt to destroy the ironworks at Batstow Village. After the war, in 1799, the first glassworks in the region would open in Port Elizabeth. Around that time, whaling operations had also ceased. The first cotton mill in the Pine Barrens also opened later in 1810 at Retreat. Cranberry bog cultivation began in the 1830s, and in 1832 the first paper mill opened in the region. It would take until 1854 for the region's first railroad crossing the Pinelands to open, connecting Camden and the newly established Atlantic City later also connecting to many smaller towns spread throughout the Pine Barrens. By 1869, the bog iron industry would come to a close in the Pine Barrens after the discovery that iron ore could be bined more cheaply in the state of Pennsylvania. Other industries including paper mills, sawmills, and grist mills would rise and fall throughout the years, mostly catering only to local markets. Smaller industries like charcoal making and glass making would also develop with varying degrees of success. Over the long haul of time, the forest would eventually reclaim most all traces of the Pine Barrens' industrial past, leading to many ghost towns and remnants of settlements being the only reminders of this era. The aforementioned village of Bastso being the only that would be restored to a mid-19th century condition, preserved as a state historic site. Now that we know more about the Pinelands' general history and how so many towns would come to be abandoned in the wake of changing industrial demands, let's move on to our topic of Harrisville. You may be asking, since there are so many ghost towns in this region, why is Harrisville the topic of this video? The answer is a bit simplistic because it stuck out to me the most when I was looking at the history of these towns. Perhaps because visually there's still some standing at ruins to look at, or due to its long history compared to some of the others, or perhaps for some other reason I can't quite explain. This doesn't negate my interest in the other towns of the region, but I decided to only choose one to talk about for this video, so here we are. Now on to its story. In the times before Harrisville was known as Harrisville, it was known as McCartyville. 
Before then, it's unknown what it was called, though judging by how many towns were simply named after the family that ran things in the region, it was likely named similarly to some other family. Between 1750 and 1760, a man named Evi Belangi Jr. would establish a combination of saw and grist mills near what would become Harrisville, later accompanied by the Wading River Forge and a slitting mill founded by Isaac Potts in 1795. Potts was also responsible for founding the nearby Martha Furnace two years prior. Martha Furnace was a large iron blast furnace located a short distance up the Oswego River from the location of Harrisville, which at its peak supported around 400 people in the town as well as the nearby town of Calico. Martha Furnace's primary product was pig iron, though other items such as stoves, firebacks, sash weights, etc. were also produced. As more settlements were built in the Pine Barrens, nails would also become a prime commodity. Potts, being more of a real estate speculator than an iron master, would sell his forge and slitting mill in 1797 to George and William Ashbridge and Joseph Walker, also selling Martha Furnace a few years later. Property changed hands often in the area, as by this time, it was rough going for industry in the area. Because of this, around 1832, William McCarty, Thomas Davies, and Isaac Ashmead would all once be owners of these sites. By this time, the iron industry in the Pine Barrens was already in a heavy decline, and McCarty and Davies would turn their attention to paper production, following McCarty buying out Ashmead's interest in the property. In 1834, they would obtain a mortgage for $10,000, roughly $300,000 in modern figures, and began their work on a new mill for the production of paper. They began work on a canal to divert water from the old mill pond, now known as Harrisville Lake, to build a new mill near to the lake. McCarty designed and engineered this canal, and it ran for around three-tenths of a mile, dug entirely by hand labor, mostly consisting of the numerous unemployed iron workers in the area. Another smaller canal would also be dug to power the grist and saw mill. This smaller canal would be a diversion for the main canal, reconnecting with it before it crosses what is now modern-day Route 563. Paper was made from the salt hay harvested from the nearby meadowlands, with wagons arriving daily with new loads, as well as loads of paper scraps, rags, and other old cloth products brought in from New York or Philadelphia. While I could go into detail about the process of manufacturing the paper, we'd be going a bit far off topic here, so let's move on. McCartyville, as it was now known, was growing prosperous very quickly. In addition to its paper mill, which was one of the most advanced in the country at the time, a grist mill, two sawmills, and a company store would also be built. The store generated a profit of nearly $3,000 annually, or roughly $95,000 in modern figures. To house the workers, McCarty built several cottages a short distance from the mill, also constructing a dining hall and a dormitory where workers could have a hot meal each night in exchange for a weekly fee taken from their pay. Across from the dining hall, McCarty would build himself a large mansion. Plans were also drawn up for a second paper mill to further output in the future. In November of 1846, disaster would strike the town. A fire broke out at the paper mill heavily damaging the building. In 1847, the Wading River Manufacturing and Canal Company, as McCarty's enterprise was called, repaired the building and began processing paper again. However, the financial strain of rebuilding the mill was too great for the company to survive much longer. The property was later sold at a sheriff's sale, which is an auction of defaulted or repossessed properties at the end of a foreclosure process. McCarty was able to buy back one quarter interest in the property, but by then it was too late. The mill was now idle, and McCarty later sold his interest in the property to Thomas Albert Haven. On May 1st of 1851, Richard Harris and his brother Benjamin gained control over the property which was complicated by legal problems that were not resolved until 1855 due to the death of the previous owner, Thomas Albert Haven, and the subsequent wrangling by his heirs over the property. 
In 1856, the Harrises obtained a mortgage for $7,552.86, roughly in the ballpark of $240,000 today from John H. Simon, who controlled the remaining three quarters of the former McCartyville property. Simon agreed to finance the Harrises' purchase of the property if they would offer their own quarter as security. The brothers agreed and on November 2nd of 1856, they finally had full control over the property. By 1858, several other Harris brothers, as well as their father, bought and sold interests in the property. And by the end of 1858, the mill had been put back into operation with the sole owners of Harrisville, as it was now known, being Richard and his father John, with John taking care of the financial and management assistance to the company. The real leader behind Harrisville's day-to-day -day activities, however, was Richard. John Harris would later retire in 1866, returning to his native Philadelphia. In this era, Harrisville would go through a period of rapid expansion. Harris would build two mansions opposite the mill while also modernizing the mill, creating the Harrisville Public School and adding several other buildings to the property. The former McCarty Mansion and his opposite dining hall were split into two family homes. The main canal was enlarged, and in 1865, a booster canal was dug between the west branch of the Wading River to the Oswego River to increase the level of the lake. In 1866, an artesian well was also dug, though it was quickly abandoned due to the high iron content in the water. Around 1867, the Springfield gas generator was installed at Harrisville which allowed gas-powered illumination for some of the homes, as well as the streetlights along Main Street. The generator house was located under what today is Route 563 and featured a large tank for storing gasoline. Air was pumped over the tank, which vaporized the gasoline and forced it under pressure to the various light fixtures throughout the village. By 1877, the town was beginning to feel the effects of age and competition. More modern mills were outpacing the production from the nearly 50-year-old Harrisville Mill, and they had better connections to railroads. A new mortgage for $20,000 was secured in 1888, but by 1891 the property was once again in foreclosure and sold at another sheriff's sale. It would then be bought and foreclosed on once more, being bought by, and no, I'm not making this up, the article I'm referencing actually says this, a mysterious stranger on June 13th of 1896 for $30,000. This stranger, when called upon to pay a 10% down payment for his winning bid, said that his pocketbook containing a $25,000 certified check was missing. After being verbally assaulted by the other bidders, the stranger fled and was never heard from again. A new auction was then held with Mark Soy, an agent for Joseph Wharton, winning the auction for $12,000. When it was time for Soy to pay the 10% deposit, Elias Wright, another agent for Wharton, collected checks from Soy and Jerome Grigg. He presented the sheriff with three checks from Joseph Wharton totaling $1,200. The crowd was outraged that he had employed shill bidders. The sale, however, was not invalidated. And on July 16th of 1896, the deed was presented to Wharton. The village remained in good shape by the time Wharton took possession. Several of the families who had worked at the Harrisville Mill continued to live at the site, though having to resort to berry picking to eke out a living. The two mansions were still in good shape as well, one still containing furniture owned by Richard Harris, which would be later moved to a house in New Gretna that Richard and his brother Howard were now living in. The mill itself had been damaged by another fire and was all but useless. Wright suggested to Wharton that the mill building should be torn down and its machinery sold for scrap. The Broom family, longtime friends and employees of the Harrises, were allowed to live in the smaller of the mansions rent-free should they act as caretakers for Harrisville for Wharton. Wharton also invested some money into repairing the dam at the pond as it was his intention to dam many of the ponds and rivers in the Pine Barrens and transport the water to Philadelphia. However, after the New Jersey legislature banned the sale of New Jersey water outside the state, Wharton turned to agriculture and likely leased some of the land to the local Cranberry Bog operations. In 1909, after Wharton's death, 
The YMCA of Atlantic City obtained permission to use the Harrisville site as a summer camp for boys. Though Wharton had forbade it, his estate was more open to the idea. Several buildings would be converted into camp offices, kitchens, etc. In the spring of 1910, a group became the first campers at Camp Lion. However, in April of 1914, a forest fire sweeping through the area would consume Harrisville, obliterating the remaining structures. Afterwards, vandals and treasure hunters descended on the ruins, carting away stone and anything left of value. The passage of time following this would take its toll on what remained. The walls of the mill, which were still standing after the fire, eventually crumbled. Today, only the south wall and a small spire from the north wall still stand, with two walls from the grist mill barely standing as well. In the 1970s, the state constructed a chain-link fence surrounding the ruins of the mill site in order to protect what little remained of Harrisville. Today, the former site of Harrisville has been mostly reclaimed by the forest. The nearby lake still retains the town's name, and from above you can see evidence of the old roads and the canals around the site, and a nearby campground still exists, though no longer on the actual site. The site still does attract visitors as it's situated just beside modern-day Chatsworth Road. There's also quite a good amount of well-documented footage of the site that I was able to find thanks to uploads from YouTube. The modern footage you're seeing here being shared by a channel called New Jersey Outdoor Adventures. Check the video description here for a link to the original footage and go give his channel some love for his efforts. Various mounds of stone and a few walls are most of what still remains, besides the abandoned paths, roadways, and canals. I get a very melancholic feeling when I see this sort of footage. Especially knowing now what I do about the town's rise and fall. It's a shame more of Harrisville couldn't have been saved from the fires and the looters, and time for that matter. Again, Harrisville is just one of many abandoned and forgotten ghost towns and industrial locations in the Pine Barrens. Others, such as the strangely named Ong's Hat, Atzian, Red Oak Grove, Marianne Forge, Rockwood, and Acerdotten are just some of the names of the lost settlements that once bustled in this region. Nowhere else in the Pine Barrens has the region demonstrated more clearly its capacity to erase mankind's handiwork than at Harrisville. In less than a century, the town has been reduced from a prosperous industrial community to a small cluster of vanishing ruins and scattered piles of rubble being consumed by the forest. Nothing of note that I could find has really occurred around the site in the years since the fires and the looting, other than the occasional inquisitive visitors stopping to see what's behind the fences. There are still organizations out there, such as the Pinelands Preservation Alliance, that have a mission to protect the natural and cultural resources of the region. So here's to hoping that what remains of old Harrisville will live on for future generations to learn about and to visit. For me, I found researching and learning about this ghost town's history to be fascinating. I would love to go into detail with some of the history of the other Pine Barrens ghost towns in the future too. Something about ghost towns I just find really, really fascinating. The people who lived there, the history, who settled it. I would love to visit the site myself, though it's across the entire North American continent from where I currently live, so not so sure about that happening in my immediate future. I hope you enjoyed the story. Hopefully you learned something new or were at the very least entertained by it. If you'd be so kind, remember to give this video a like. It really helps me combat the awful YouTube algorithm. 
and also consider subscribing. I'd really love to see this channel grow. I get a lot of enjoyment out of making this type of content. In any case, thank you so much for watching. Feel free to leave your thoughts below in the comments section if you'd like. And that will do it for the story of Harrisville, New Jersey. Until next time, take care.